a very good evening to each and every one of you joining me, Mr. Linda Scandal, and Mr. Mark Llewellyn. Uh, how's your week been? Busy. You know, I've, I've, I have appeared in three town halls in two days. Oh, yes. Doing what? Uh, after the speaking. I've been talking about Victorian criminals and uh, Coronation Street. Oh. Yes. In fact, I made a joke at one about Corrie having lots of crime and only one policeman. And the fellow got up at the end and said he torched the Colson Smith who plays the policeman. Hmm. Oh, well, that's, that's show. Is what's on the show today? <laughs> well, I've been taking a walk uh, down Key Street to the old Granada studio. Oh, yes. yes. I've been speaking to a lovely lady called Bronte about a brand new play that's coming your way. And I've been talking to Kenneth Allen Taylor, who used to appear on the cobbles and is a bit of a panto legend. I'm so legend. This is how your show's looking. Good, exciting and packed show. And we start with our Belinda, who is in the snow. The details of play that's coming to Manchester. And joining us now is Bronte. Bronte, tell us all about this wonderful show of yours. So it's called Cathy and Stella Solve a Murder. We are at home in Manchester um, from the 5th to the 21st of October. And we're currently in Bristol Old Vic, having just finished the Fringe in August. And uh, what is it all about then? Tell us the, the, the full story of this. So it's called Cathy and Stella Solve a Murder. It's a musical about two best mates from Hull who um, run Hull's least successful murder podcast. So it's, um, it's about friendship. We're currently playing at Bristol Vic, and then we're coming to Manchester home from the 5th to the 21st of August. Uh, August? October. Good. <laughs> and uh, what is it all about then? Tell us the, the, the full story of this. So um, we first workshopped it, started um, working on it last year in the spring. It's by two wonderful writers, Matthew Floyd-Jones and Jim Wilson. And they've written quite a lot together before, but um, this was their lockdown sort of baby. And um, it sort of delves into the phenomenon the genre of true crime um because um kathy and stella have this podcast but it is the thread that just keeps them together it's um it's about friendship it's about female friendship more than anything um and it's a it's a really really brilliant show it sounds like it's going to be absolutely immense where can we find this where can we find this and uh why should people come and watch this right so come find us at the hope theater at Home, home. I am not awake this morning. I do apologise. At home, Manchester. That's where we are. Um, and um, so we're on till the fifth, from the fifth to the twenty-first of October. Um, it is a fast-paced, fun, relatable story, full of really, really catchy tunes, and you are bound to laugh your socks off. That's my take of it. <laughs> Everybody, make sure you go and watch this. Bronte, thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you very much, Belinda. Now, I have been out and about in the city centre finding out about Key Street. So we start this week's walk at the top of Key Street and behind me what used to be Manchester's tallest building, Sunlight House, built in the 1930s. Now, a Russian came to live in Britain. He wanted to give himself a much easier British name. He found a bar of soap called Sunlight and he renamed himself Joseph Sunlight. So this building is Sunlight House. And you might remember down the side, Liz Dawn, who played the Redux with the Coronation Street, who used to have a pub there, the Old Drakes. I certainly remember that. So we've just come down past the Opera House, which was built in 1912. It opened as the new theatre and then was renamed the Opera House in the 1920s. It opened with a production of Kismet. And now we're turning on to Byram Street, named after Edward Byram, who amongst many other things opened Manchester's first bank. At the end of Byram Street, we reach St John's Gardens, so called because St John's Church stood in the middle here. In fact, this was the church and the graveyard. When it was demolished, there were a lack of parishioners living in the area, it had to be turned into a park. There was a clause in Edward Byram's will that specified that this land could never be built on. Then beneath us are the bodies of those who were buried in the church. One of those who was buried here was William Marsden, one of the leaders really of a campaign to get workers a half day regulated holiday on Saturdays. So that's how we get the Saturdays off, thanks to him. And one of his descendants today is Sir Ian McKellen.
When Coronation Street started, the cast came together and their original cast photograph was taken just over there. The Victorian Albert Warehouse, that was turned into a hotel. Still is the Victorian Albert Hotel, and that was owned by Granada Studios. In order to capitalize on the opening of their theme park, which was just down here, which I'm sure many of you remember, the old Houses of Parliament set, the borrowers, all the rest of it, you could even walk the cobbles. They then also bought Harry Ramsden's, and they opened a Harry Ramsden's down at the end of the road, so they had everything covered. What they didn't have was a soap opera to run at weekends. And so they came up with the fated Albion Market, and that was filmed in the building just behind me. So we'll move from Albion Market to Coronation Street. Let's have a sneaky peek at what they've done with the old studios. So we end our walk on the old Coronation Street set. This one that stood here from 1968 to 1982 was opened by the Queen and Prince Philip. And you can see where the uh, arches were at the top of the street and then of course the street ran down through the middle of the site down to what was the medical center spent many happy hours and days here and lots of tales to tell you can now get here because they're redeveloping the site and this brings us to the end of the walk we hope you'll follow in our footsteps and explore a bit more of manchester city center <music> Would you believe it? We've been joined by a gentleman in here now. now hello, welcome. Introduce yourself. Tell everybody who you are. Hi, Blender. I'm Chris Smith. I'm director of CND Security Limited. Yeah. Now, what is CND Security Limited? So, CND Security are one of the largest suppliers of door staff on Canal Street. We've got uh, nine venues at the moment. Uh, we've been trading down in the village now for two years. Mm -hmm. And why did it begin for you? So, I got a phone call one night. Uh, if I can provide security staff. So I checked up on insurance, first of all, made sure that I could, got some insurance and I provided uh, two door staff, including myself, first of all, to my first venue. Uh, and then uh, word got around say that I was basically on in the village again and I was doing venues. So then word spread that uh, Chris is looking for venues and that's how it started. But it's been successful because a lot of security companies you hear about, it's always you hear about the... Well, they're not so good stories. For you guys, though, I touch wood so far, I've heard nothing but good things about why have your company been successful over the others. So with, with C&D, we uh, train our own staff. Uh, so um, when you first get your SIA license, you, you told the SIA guidelines uh, and then you go out in the open world to do your first shift and nobody comes to check on you after that. So nobody does any additional training. So I basically make sure all my staff are trained. I uh, guide them, give them advice, give them guidance uh, throughout the shifts. And we have a lot, lot of team members that have got a lot of experience that do that with our team. Um, as well as, because we've got a training centre, um, when the SIA bought new regulations out last year for counter-terrorism, first aid, we was, be able, we was able to jump on that first of all and make sure all our staff was compliant um, and we was able to um, make sure that we're, we're dealing with the right customers in the village mm -hmm. uh, because you know as well as I know it's a broad spectrum of oh, people yes. that we get um, and all our staff are very versed in dealing with everyone that comes to the village these days. And you continue the training as well don't you? Yeah so uh, we, I've got four trainers that work for me at the moment so we do everything from personal license security courses first first aid training and uh, all sorts of food food hygiene training so it's all in there now what venues what venues do you actually have then so we have bar pop church the goose new york new york home chinese napoleon's clone zone thompson's that's it off the top of my head at the moment. Now, how long have you been trading for? Because that sounds fantastic to have so many venues so quick. Uh, just under two years. We have got venues outside the village. We've got the George in Oldham. We've got Piccadilly Tap. We've got another venue opening in Victoria soon. Uh, stuff in Stockport and Buxton as well. So I suppose without giving your magic trick away, what would you say for anybody looking at setting up a security is, is like the secret ingredient? Uh, invest in your staff. So be open and honest with your staff. Um, invest time into your staff because they're the ones that are out there earning your money for you. 
uh, as a business owner, I wouldn't be where I am today if it wasn't for the loyal staff and the, the good work that they put in. Because if I employed uh, substandard staff, I wouldn't have a business. That's fair enough, isn't it? I mean, you are doing remarkably well. Why should venues come to seeing the security? So we... We offer uh, a full range of packages from training um, to security, and we even offer health and safety reviews to venues as well. Um, so it's a complete package that you're going to get with us. And with C&D, we're unlike other security companies. We will not take on work that we can't fulfill ourselves. So you see other security companies subcontracting work out. We won't do that. Uh, if we take on your venue, you will have specific people at work for you on your venue and you they will be accountable to you as as well as myself yeah. it's it's all just fantastic stuff it really really is and it's successful and it's doing well and there's been no trouble so to, to just the the people that work in security that you know are a bit perhaps like no longer interested if for them it is literally just for the money why do you think what would you say to them is the reason why they should keep going in this profession the, the security industry is ever changing um, from when, when I first started over 14 years ago, it's changed a lot. Uh, everything's changing all the time. Uh, you don't know what's around the corner. I thought that I will be in a dead end job all my life and just going working for other people. So you, if you work your way up within a business, you can succeed. It's amazing. Well, thank you so much for your time today. Absolutely amazing. What we're going to do now is we're going to hand over to Studio 2, where I believe our Mark Llewellyn has jetted to as we speak. And he's speaking to somebody that you might just recognise. It's a great pleasure to welcome a dear friend, someone I've known for 30 years, into our little Rover set. Welcome, Kenneth Allen Taylor. Well, it, it's just amazing to be here. I can't believe we've known each other 30 years because we don't look old enough. Well, we're only in our 40s, aren't we? How can it be? <laughs> Third time around nearly for me. <laughs> but yes, here we are. So we worked together for many years at the Oldham Coliseum Theatre. Now, sadly, sadly gone. gone. Um, very sad indeed. And uh, you started there how long ago now? <laughs> you see, 1959. 59. That was my first introduction to the north of England. I mean, I'd worked in Scotland, I'd worked in Wales, but I'd never been to Oldham. So when you arrived in Oldham for the first time, what was the impression of the town? I couldn't believe that there were cobble streets and it was raining, of course. <laughs> And when I looked down, the rain was, the water running down was black from all the pollution. Anyway, I found my digs, um, went to work next morning, and behind the Coliseum there was a little row of cottages called Barkham Place. Yeah. And as I walked down, a lady came out, this is the absolute truth, 1959, November, in Clogs and Shaw. I couldn't believe it. And I rang my mum at night and said, Mum, they still wear clothes and shawls in Oldham. Um, and that evening, I got on the bus. We probably finished rehearsal about five. It was pitch black by then. It went upstairs for a cigarette, as one did. <laughs> yeah. And it was all steamed up. And then three ladies got on. And I thought, oh, God, it's snowing. And I wiped the window clean and looked out. No snow. It's odd. And then I noticed it didn't move, it didn't melt. And when I got back to my digs, I said to the lady, there were ladies with white stuff in there. What was that? It was the, 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 the cotton, yeah. Cotton and yeah, extraordinary. Yeah. And the people that were came through that rep system at Oldham, I mean, so many went on to oh. become household names, didn't they? It's so, um, um, Anne Kirkbride, Anne Kirkbride uh, 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 Mark Barbara. Lavelle, um, Barbara Knox, Barbara Knox so, Meg Johnson, yeah, um, Julie Goodyear. Julie Goodyear. Oh, Julie Goodyear. I can remember her first morning as an assistant stage manager. I went into rehearsal and Carl Paulson, who was the artistic director, said, hey, come with me a minute. And he took me to the back of the theatre and there was a young girl, blonde, with a little mink jacket on, mm -hmm. sweeping the stage. And I said, that looks like Minky. He said, it is. I said, who is she? He said, she's the new assistant stage manager. He said, but 
come around the back. And we went around the back of the theatre, show me the car park. <laughs> it's a, a white sports car. <laughs> I said, who is said, that, that girl? I said, who is she? She's called Julie Goodyear. I said, but where'd she get her money from? It? I don't know, but I'm in the wrong business, obviously. <laughs> she was amazing. Mm. She was so, so, such fun, one of the funniest people I've ever worked with. Many, many stories, aren't there? Oh. Uh, Julie Goodyear um, was in Coronation Street briefly, and then I think it was Pat Phoenix who told her to go to Oldham Rep and introduced her. So you worked with Pat as well. Pat did, uh, oh, God, Pat, suddenly last summer, mm. um, from the, the, the film, which was Elizabeth Taylor, and I remember Carl Paulson saying to her, it's very serious, but it, mm. she's put in an asylum and has... They want to give her a lobotomy, if anybody doesn't know the story by Tennessee Williams. And Carl said to her, look, you know, she's a very ordinary woman. You can't be over-glamorous. And she said, no, 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 I, I won't be. Um, well, she turned up with <laughs> Jiboa, well, white yeah. Jiboa and pearls and everything. And that was the first time in my life I'd had champagne in a dressing room in a silver goblet. Oh, really? That was first night at Phoenix in suddenly last summer. Right. So a lot of the cast were picked up by Coronation Street, or well, Granada casting, really, yes, wasn't it? I mean, because was... Granada used to come. And we also, they also had this wonderful system in those days. Um, Granada, if it had a play that it wasn't certain, mm. it paid for Oldham Rep to put it on. As right. It was Oldham Rep then. Yeah. Um, uh, Life of Tanks, I think, was one Victorian which we did. Mm -hmm. um, I think we did three, and Granada paid for them. They, ne they never went on television right. for some reason. But uh, <laughs> no, it was extraordinary. The number of people who went from the rep to... Yeah, yeah. Well, you, you and your wife, Judith, of course. I mean, oh, yes, Judith yes. played Ken Barlow's Judith's wife, Janet. Was it the second or first wife? Second, I think, was she, it? She committed suicide. Yeah, she did, didn't she? Um, and, uh, yes, I went in as, uh, well, again, you see, with Roy, I was asked to go in because uh, Julie was coming out very quickly because her mother was ill. That's right. And I yeah. was asked to go in because Roy and I had worked together. Mm. And uh, we had proper rehearsals in those mm. days. You rehearse well. And I was called Cecil Newton. And we came to the recording, and uh, Roy had always said, well, what do you think, Cecil? What do you think of this, Cecil? And suddenly he said, well, what do you think, Cecil? <laughs> and if you could see it, I almost go. You can see me holding him. <laughs> He did just, uh, and from then on, I was Cess. I, well, that's what I always think of it you, of the character, Cess. Cess. That was from Roy. It, yeah. was, it was actually, originally the script said Cecil, but Roy changed it to Cess. Right. So you appeared as Cecil Newton. Cecil Newton. Or Cess. Um, the Newton, I think they're just in the plot now. They've just oh. sold up, and the Rovers has closed down. It can't be. Well, uh, last night, yes. Last um, night, yeah. They all got yeah. the sack instantly, which I don't know if that would be allowed. You wouldn't have allowed that, um, would you, if you no. were in charge? <laughs> and uh, and it's, it's a Newton, because I, yes. I don't know who he is, a Newton has Newton. been in recently. Yeah. They've closed it. Everybody's got the sack instantly. Mm. Um, you became legend for your Panto Dame. You ended up with a bus named after you. Um, is it still on? Is it still it's there? Still Does it run on time? I, I don't have any of it. Once. Um, it when they because they sponsored Pantheon yeah. for many years and still do at Nottingham. Uh, they said uh, they wanted to name a bus after me. Now I was quite thrilled about that because a lot of my friends um, have got OBEs and things. Yes, and I hadn't got anything. And then I thought, hang on. There were, at the time, and this was a few years ago, about five years ago, there were only 37 people with a bus named after them. <laughs> well, OBEs, everybody's got them. I've now got a BE. I, I know you yeah. have, Rich Empire. But the, the bus was quite extraordinary. Um, yes, it's still there. If you go to Nottingham, 
uh, look out for Ken's bus. It, it has my name on the. Phone. I know it does. Yeah. I've seen <laughs> it. <laughs> sure. So you are doing uh, an evening with, aren't you, at yes. uh, Shaw Playhouse at, Two? Uh, Playhouse Two, Compton Shaw. Shaw, sure, yes, in uh, Oldham. Two in Oldham, just outside Oldham. Um, I did it. Well, I did one at Nottingham uh, earlier in the year yeah. for the Lakeside Theatre for charity. And it, it went quite well. And then I did it for the penultimate night at Oldham Coliseum. Yes, <clears throat> I was there. Um, I know. And a lot of, I mean, it's said old people from the... Well, we are now. <laughs> well, you're not. I am. <laughs> and uh, that concentrated on my years at Oldham, obviously. Mm. And then so many people afterwards came up honestly and said, but, well, what about the rest of your career? And I thought, well, yes, but... Can't come back to Oldham. They've closed the theatre mm. tragically, yeah. wrongly, yes, appallingly, not necessarily. <laughs> no, they've closed it for their own reasons. I don't know why. Don't get me on that because I'm so angry about yeah. it. Yeah, well, uh, that theatre could be saved. Yeah. We now know from an independent report that under a million pounds would make that theatre fine. Mm. They're spending twenty-four million on a shoebox. Mm. No fly tower, no more pantomimes, massive bar, massive uh, cafe, but mm. a little tiny theatre, mm. which will not be producing anything. Mm. It's absolutely outrageous. Mm. Anyway, where was I? Yes. <laughs> I saw, well, I have had, as you rightly said, quite a long career. You have. Worked with some very lovely people. Mm. Um, I thought, well, why don't I do... A one-man show mm -hmm. starting from when I was 18 up until now. It's going to be a long night. <laughs> That's what I like. It's like Ken Dodd, isn't it? <laughs> well, perhaps my wife said this morning, perhaps because I do tend to talk a lot, as you might have known, perhaps she said, well, can you come back tomorrow? Now? Well, yes. It's <laughs> two nights. Um, so I'm doing it literally from when I was 18 up until... Now, now in my um, late twenties, <laughs> <laughs> very good. So this is um, October the twenty first. October the twenty first, Crompton Playhouse. Um, only ten pound ticket. I mean, it's ridiculously cheap. Very right, yes. the price. You're being robbed, aren't you? Uh, well, I I wanted less. Oh, did you? Well, pensioners. Some pensioners can't afford a lot of money. Yeah. And, I don't want to insult anybody, but I'm sure it'll be full of elderly ladies and gentlemen because yes. they're the only ones that know, you know who I am. You know your audience. And I also talk about so many people that young people, I will explain who they are. Mm. But for instance, I talk about three and sixpence at one mm. point mm. and one and mm. sixpence. Mm. Well, that's the foreign language. You talk about Arthur Askey. Mm. They think, who the hell is Jesse he talking Matthews. about? Jesse Matthews worked with her as mm. well. Well, we've run out of time. Well, thank you. But I think off camera, we'll probably have another hour <laughs> at least. <laughs> and go along and you're going to hear about people like Dora Bryan, who you may also never have heard of. Yes. But we could both do a good hour on her on our own. But it's been absolutely lovely to have you in Bell's Bar this evening. And uh, I wish you much continued success. I'm honoured and thank you. for. I really am so pleased that I rang you up and said, please, can you help me? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, speak to my agent. <laughs> no, it's been brilliant. Thank you very, very, very welcome.